My name is Jeffrey Joyer from University of Massachusetts Extension. The webinar series is a collaborative effort of UMass Extension, University of Connecticut Extension, in, and University of New Hampshire Extension. And it is sponsored by Sandro Horcher and Blackmore Company. The theme for the webinar series is Growing Healthy Roots. And the title of the webinar today is Managing pH in the Growing Media. And our speaker is Dr. Ryan Dixon, who is a greenhouse specialist with the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension. If you have any question during the webinar, please type it on the question box. And at the end of the webinar, Ryan will answer the questions. After the webinar, there will be a short survey. Please complete the survey before exiting the webinar. Before I pass the controls to Ryan, I'd like to mention that the recordings of the webinars are posted on the UMass Extension Greenhouse and Floriculture website. And the, the URL is shown on the on this. Sorry about that. The URL of the is shown on, on the, uh, the slide on the bottom of this of the of the slide. At this point, I would like to pass the controls to Ryan to continue with the webinar. Okay, Ryan, it's all yours now. Okay, looks like we're up. Can you see my screen, Jeffrey? Yes, good. All right, well, thanks very much. And um, hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Ryan Dixon. I'm the state specialist for greenhouse management here at the University of New Hampshire, um, Cooperative Extension, and um, pleased to be here today. And, and this is the fifth webinar in our Growing Healthy Roots series, and the topic is gonna be on managing pH um, in the growing media. So for the outline for this webinar, first we'll discuss several factors that influence pH in the root zone and how we can manage these factors. And then we'll transition into different options that we can use to correct high and low pH problems. So first of all, what is pH? And when we think about pH and measure pH, we're, we're typically doing so in water or in solution. So let's look at water first. And so what we're looking at in this slide is a water molecule. It's one oxygen atom attached to two hydrogen or H plus atoms, and that is our, our water molecule. And so when we're thinking about a, a big body of water, a very, very small percentage of those water molecules actually split apart and they dissociate into an H plus hydrogen ion, um, or also called a proton, and an OH hydroxyl ion, which is OH negative, that's one oxygen and, and one hydrogen. And so the water molecule splits, um, the hydrogen is an acid, and the hydroxyl ion is a base, and that's what influences pH in, in that solution. And so when we measure pH, we're actually measuring the concentration of the acids in the water. And so going back to high school chemistry for a lot of us, but a pH of seven, um, is neutral. This means that we have a balance of the acid hydrogens and the OH bases. Um, they're equal. A low pH is going to indicate an acid situation where we have more acid than we have base. And then a high pH situation will be where um, will be values above seven and we have more base than we do acid. And so when we're measuring pH in the growing media, or also the substrate pH, um, as we sometimes call it, we're actually measuring um, the acid in the um, substrate solution. And so it's important to know that the pH of the growing media is going to affect several things. And one of the dominant things that's affected is, is first and foremost nutrient solubility from our fertilizers. So if we look to the right, we have um, a graph where we have going down, we have the different essential fertilizer nutrients that we need for plant growth. And on the bottom, we have the root media pH from 4.5 to um, 7.5. And the thicker the bars, um, the more 
soluble that nutrient is, and the skinnier the bars, the less soluble um, that nutrient is in, in water. And so what we see for certain nutrients like phosphorus, and especially for manganese, iron, zinc, copper, and boron, is that as the pH goes up, the solubility of those nutrients in water decreases. And as the pH goes down, their solubility increases. So pH affects solubility of nutrients. So nutrient uptake by plant roots. Well, roots can only take up nutrients that are dissolved in water. And so the higher pH, the less iron and manganese, for example, are dissolved in water, and so the less they're able to be taken up by roots. And so this has certain implications on plant health. Um, as pH goes up, um, we uh, can get deficiency in certain nutrients such as iron and manganese because they're um, their uptake decreases. As pH goes down for some crops, the solubility of iron and manganese and other micronutrients increases, and if too much uptake occurs by the plant roots, then we can get toxicity. Okay. It's just another example of how substrate pH affects micronutrient solubility and uptake by plant roots. In this case, we're looking at in patients. And if we look towards, um, so we've got impatience here grown from pH 4.4 up to seven on the right. And so if we look at the plant on the far right, grown at pH seven, um, it's a little bit stunted and the newer leaves are looking very yellow. Uh, they're showing intervenal chlorosis. That's a symptom of, of iron and manganese deficiency in the new growth. And it's because at pH seven, iron and manganese are less soluble and, and um, we're running into deficiency symptoms. But when pH drops to six and below six, those nutrients are adequately available and the plants can take them up and, and look healthy. And an important note here is that impatience is a relatively um, tolerant plant of a wide range of pH. So even at a very low pH of 4.4, um, which is pretty acidic, uh, impatience still seems to be doing um, and often does fairly well. So iron and manganese toxicity at low pH. This is a problem that tends to occur in, in certain sensitive crops, such as geranium, which is on the left, and marigold, which is on, um, on the right. And typically um, what we uh, tend to see is, is micronutrients accumulating in the older tissue. And so at low pH, micronutrients are more soluble. They're taken up in, in high quantities, and then they're deposited into the lower leaves of the plant. The symptoms often show up as bronze speckling or necrosis, usually around the edge of the leaf, moving inwards. Um, and that, that's pretty characteristic of, of toxicity for lots of, of elements. Tends to be less common of a, of a problem, um, usually in what we call iron efficient crops, such as geranium and marigold, which are um, adapt to taking up lots of iron and manganese from the root zone. A more common problem is probably going to be iron and manganese deficiency at high pH. So as pH increases, iron and manganese tend to decrease in their solubility, and so the plant can't take them up as, as well. And so we're looking at petunia on the left um, and calibricoa on the right. We see that chlorosis is developing in the young leaves. It's often intervenal, meaning that the leaf is yellow, but the veins still stay green. It's in the young leaves because that's the part of the plant that's growing, and iron and manganese cannot be moved from the bottom of the plant to the top of the plant when deficiency happens. Um, generally, this, this occurs when the pH in the growing media climbs above 6.4 um, for sensitive crops, such as, as these two species. And as I said earlier, tends to be a common problem in greenhouse, also in nursery production, especially when we have low EC or low fertilizer salts in the media as well. So before we get too far, managing pH in the growing media, it doesn't have to be too complicated, okay? Main points, if you maintain a pH around 5.6 to 6.4, you're gonna be just fine with most of the crops that you grow. It does help to know what factors influence pH during production and how they interact with each other. 
And then of course, monitoring the pH regularly in the root zone using in-house soil tests or perhaps a commercial lab periodically um, is a good idea, especially if you're growing um, crops that are sensitive to nutritional problems. There are several factors that influence pH in the growing media and can change pH over time in the crop. Um, one of the common factors is gonna be the substrate and the substrate components. And so lots of our substrates in greenhouse and nursery production, they're, they're peat um, based or bark based. These are acidic materials. So acid tends to drop pH. Um, pH, common um, starting pH of, of peat could be as low as 3.5 in some cases. And so those are very acidic materials that, um, that push pH down. Limestone is a base. And so we typically add limestone to the medium to counteract that acidity and then raise the pH up to around a six where we like to grow most of our crops. And if there's any kind of residual or long-term reactivity with, with the limestone that we use, meaning that the limestone continues to dissolve over time during the crop, that can actually push pH up over time as well. Another common factor that's going to affect pH in the root zone is going to be the fertilizer. And so uh, specifically in this case, the amount of fertilizer that we apply. So applying high amounts of fertilizer and building salts, soluble fertilizer salts in the root zone is going to increase the electrical conductivity or the EC of the root zone. And is going to tend to have an acidic effect that pushes pH down. On the other hand, if we have low soluble salts in the root zone and a low EC, that's going to tend to push pH up. So talking about fertilizer effects, low salts in the root zone and high pH tend to go hand in hand. And so what we're looking at in this picture is an example of petunia cuttings that were rooted in a soilless media and they currently have low soluble salts in the root zone, lots of leaching happened, um, the pH is high and they're starting to turn chlorotic in the young tissue. And so here's a graph illustrating why that, that's occurring. And so point here is that leaching lowers the soluble salts and fertilizer in the root zone and tends to increase pH. And so what we're looking at on the bottom is, is container capacities leached on the x-axis. So the higher that value, the more leaching of water through the media is occurring. On the left, we have the substrate EC, or soluble salts in the substrate, fertilizer salts. And on the right, we have the pH. And so if we start at the left-hand side with little to no leaching, we have um, high soluble salts in a low pH. And as we leach more, we see the salts in the EC decrease and the pH goes up. And this was done on a, a very common, these are data from a trial with um, very common um, greenhouse substrates. So the more we leach, the lower we drop EC and pH tends to go up. So why does this happen? Well, um, leaching tends to wash away the fertilizer salts in the media, which raises pH. And so what we're looking at is, is a close-up uh, illustration of peat particles in our growing media, exchange sites on those peat particles, which hold, in this case, hydrogen protons, acid, and calcium, Ca++, and then hydrogen protons in the solution, um, in the soil solution, um, where we measure pH. And so as we wash nutrients out of the media and we leach heavily, we wash those fertilizer nutrients away, that frees up space on those, those peat particles, and then the acid protons or hydrogen are attracted to our substrate particles. So more acid on the substrate, less acid in solution, and that raises the pH. So that's how leaching raises the pH in the root zone. Adding fertilizer, on the other hand, tends to drop pH. And so in this case, we've got similar illustration. Um, we have hydrogen protons occupying the surface 
of our growing media particles. And as we add fertilizer, in this case, calcium, calcium is very strongly attracted to the surface of growing media. Calcium comes in, it bumps the hydrogen off, we get more hydrogen in solution, and that's gonna lower the pH. So simply adding fertilizer in some cases where you have low EC um, um, causes a chemical reaction that drops pH. It's important to note that the pre-plant nutrients um, that we incorporate in the media before we plant has the same effect and can, can also drop pH. And so we're looking at some data in this table here um, where we have different pre-plant fertilizer nutrients added to the substrate. Um, we have a clear water control, um, ammonium salts, potassium salts, um, magnesium and calcium, and then the pH of the starting media before planting. And so with the clear water, we have highest pH, um, and with we get a lower pH with ammonium, potassium, and magnesium, and the calcium salts tend to um, had, or in this case, had the lowest pH. And it's because that calcium is very tightly attracted to the growing media particles, and they push more acid into solution, which drops pH. So how can you actually use this information? Well, say you're in a scenario where you, in this case, we have petunia. They look iron deficient. They look chlorotic. You do a soil test on these plants, and you see that the pH is high, above 6.4 and the EC is low, meaning that there's low fertilizer in the root zone. First thing that you can do is simply apply more fertilizer. And what this is gonna do is supply nutrients for the crop to take up, so you can green the crop up just simply by applying more fertilizer. And then you'll also raise the EC in the root zone. Typically when we apply fertilizer, we're um, uh, water-soluble fertilizers, they contain um, good amounts of calcium. And so that calcium in that higher EC will help drop the pH um, below 6.4, um, where iron and manganese are, are more soluble. So low pH, or excuse me, low EC, high pH, one option you have is just fertilize more. Another factor that influences pH over time is going to be the water quality. And in production, we tend to, we, we sometimes inject acid into the water, which is going to obviously be acidic and lower pH. Um, in some cases, some growers might have high alkalinity in their irrigation water. Alkalinity is a base that raises pH. So if, let's look at the solution pH or the irrigation water pH first. And so a little bit of a, a review here, but pH can be measured with a pH meter. Below seven is acid, a pH of seven is neutral, pH above seven is basic. It's primarily going to influence the solubility of the fertilizer and the chemicals that we mix into the irrigation water. Also, the chemicals that we, um, um, certain pesticides and agrochemicals that we mix into our spray tanks will influence the solubility of those as well. In reality, the pH of the water is going to have little impact on the pH of the substrate and in the root zone. And the reason is because water is generally very poorly buffered, and so the pH of the water quickly conforms to whatever the pH of the growing media is once it's in there. Alkalinity, on the other hand, is a little bit differently, is a little different. And so alkalinity is, is not something that we can actually measure with a pH meter. Um, and it's often called bicarbonates or carbonates um, dissolved in the irrigation water. And so they're actually ions that neutralize acid in the irrigation water and raise the pH. These tend to have a large impact on substrate pH over time. And you can think of alkalinity um, simply as dissolved limestone, similar to the limestone that you would incorporate into your growing media before planting to adjust original uh, initial pH. So each time you're watering, if, if you have high alkalinity, each time you're watering your pots, you're actually adding limestone to the pot um, that's, that's raising pH. And so to illustrate in the graph on the right, we've got um, two water sources. The red line is high alkalinity, the green line is low alkalinity. 
on the left on the y-axis we have water pH and on the x-axis we have the amount of acid that it takes to neutralize that alkalinity in the water and so the key thing to, to note here first key thing is that the starting pH of both water sources is around 7 and so but so it's fairly high pH but with the red line it takes much more acid to neutralize all of that alkalinity to drop pH down to 4.5 than it does for, for um, the lower alkalinity water. And so what that means is that the high alkalinity water is gonna have a much greater impact on pH than um, the low alkalinity water, even though their starting pHs um, were the same. So we think about alkalinity, um, you know, you can measure alkalinity in your irrigation water. Um, it's good to test at least once, um, but even better twice a year. Um, but alkalinity is typically reported um, in, in different units. And by the way, lots of commercial labs will test for alkalinity. You can also purchase um, in-house testing kits as well for, for fairly cheap. Um, and so there are different units that are reported for alkalinity and it's important to to know these units um, and um, when you're making decisions about, for example, whether you need to inject acid into your water. And so common unit would be milliequivalents of alkalinity per liter. That's in the left column. So one milliequivalent of alkalinity is also equal to 50 parts per million of alkalinity um, in terms of calcium carbonate equivalents or CCE which is equivalent to 61 parts per million of bicarbonate or HCO3 minus. And so when thinking about alkalinity, around two milliequivalents of alkalinity per liter or 122 parts per million of bicarbonate is a relatively moderate and safe level of, of alkalinity to have. So if you have high alkalinity and you decide to inject acid to neutralize that alkalinity in your irrigation water, how much do you add? Well, there is an online calculator called AlkCalc. It was developed at University of New Hampshire um, by Dr. Brian Krug. And it's a very convenient way to enter in um, information regarding your water quality and figure out how much acid you actually need to apply. There's different types of acid, um, sulfuric, phosphoric, and nitric. And general rule of thumb, as um, if you're injecting acid, acidify your water to a pH of around six or two milliequivalents of, of alkalinity per liter. Another major factor that influences substrate pH is gonna be the nitrogen form in the fertilizer. And so we typically supply nitrogen as either ammonium, NH4, or nitrate, NO3. The ammonium is gonna be acidic, the nitrate is gonna be basic, and raise pH. So looking at our fertilizer label, we can determine how much ammonium and nitrate is, is in our fertilizer. So here we're looking at 201020. At the top of that label, we know that 20% of the nitrogen or 20% of the fertilizer is nitrogen, 8% is in the ammoniacal form, and 12% is in the nitrate form. If we divide that 8% ammonium by the 20% total nitrogen, we learn that 40% of the total nitrogen is ammonium. If we do the same for nitrate, um, 12 divided by 20, we learn that 60% of the fertilizer nitrogen is in the nitrate form. And this is gonna have an important um, implications on the acidity or basicity of the fertilizer program. So fertilizing with ammonium tends to be acidic um, for two reasons. And first reason is that ammonium, when supplied to the root zone, the uptake of ammonium, NH4+, um, causes plants to release acid back into the root zone. So plants um, take up ammonium, which has a one plus charge to it. Um, plants can't take up um, an imbalance of, of electrical charges in their roots. It's just not um, possible. And so they compensate by effluxing a positively charged proton, which is acid, back out of the roots. So the uptake of ammonium causes the plants to pump out acid into the root zone, which drops pH pretty rapidly. Ammonium also can drop pH through a process called nitrification, 
by soil microbes. So microorganisms in the root zone can convert ammonium um, into nitrate and also into acid. And so for every molecule of ammonium converted to, um, or nitrified, we get one molecule of nitrate and two molecules of, of acid. And so it tends to be a very acidic um, reaction. It's not related to plant uptake of ammonium, but rather microorganisms in the root zone. Nitrate, on the other hand, tends to be basic. And so the uptake of nitrate, NO3 minus, causes plants to release hydroxyl ions, OH negative, or bicarbonate ions, HCO3 negative. So these are bases that will neutralize acid in the root zone and tend to raise pH. So generally, nitrate tends to be um, a very weak type of base, um, whereas ammonium um, tends to be a, a much stronger acid. Fertilizing with nitrate doesn't always increase pH. Um, sometimes the uptake of nitrate, um, that NO3 minus, is balanced by the uptake of another nutrient, in this case potassium, that has a positive charge. And so the equal uptake of, of positive and negative charges um, cancels out and we get no pH change in the root zone. So you can match the fertilizer that you apply to the alkalinity of your water. And so looking at this table here, we've got a range of fertilizers on the left, 2177 down to 15015. So let's look at the top row first. So we have 2177. If we go over a column, we see that 100% of the nitrogen is in the ammonium in the urea form, which urea is also an acidic nitrogen form. On the fertilizer label, it tells us that this is gonna be an acidic fertilizer in that this would be um, basically the higher the value, the, um, the more acidity um, provided by the fertilizer, and that this level of, of, of acidity would be um, equal to match a water quality with a uh, water alkalinity of, of around 300 parts per million calcium carbonate equivalent. So it's a very, in this case, it's a very acidic fertilizer to match a very um, high amount of alkalinity and base in the water. If we go down to the bottom row, we look at 15015 fertilizer. This only has 13% of nitrogen in an acidic form. And this would be good to match a water quality with a very low alkalinity of 50 parts per million. And so low alkalinity water, there's the risk for pH to drop over time. And so we're applying a more basic fertilizer here to with the um, low alkalinity to prevent that from happening. So you can, you can balance high alkalinity with ammonium in the fertilizer. There are some important considerations. Ammonium can promote lush growth. There's also risk of toxicity, especially when the plants are small or when the substrate is wet and cold. General rule of thumb, if you have high alkalinity, greater than one and a half milliequivalents per liter, inject acid first um, and, and lower the basic effect of water that way. The last factor, major factor that influences pH, um, it would be the plant species that we grow. And so plant species tend to differ in how they influence pH in the root zone. Geranium is a crop that tends to um, push pH down over time. It's also sensitive to iron toxicity at low pH. And so typically we would supply geranium a more basic fertilizer to prevent that from happening. Petunia on the other hand tends to raise pH it's also sensitive to micronutrient deficiency symptoms um, at high pH. And so we can typically get away and, and often need to supply a more acidic fertilizer program to prevent running into nutritional problems with petunia. These are results from research done at University of um, Florida where we are looking to understand the pH personality, if you will, of different crop species. In other words, what is the tendency of different crops to raise or lower pH, and how does that relate to um, their sensitivity to um, low or high pH nutritional problems? And so, um, of the crops that we tested, you know, the real 
problem crops are going to be those that tend to a drop pH and are also sensitive to iron toxicity at low pH. And so in this case, it would be geranium. And with crops that are sensitive to low pH, you know, we're looking to supply high nitrate basic fertilizers to prevent pH from dropping. On the other hand, um, another group of plants prone to, to problems would be those that raise the pH and they're also sensitive to deficiency symptoms at high pH. And so if we look down at the, the bottom right, um, you know, in this test, we would, these would be petunia, pansy, vinca, and zinnia. And so these plants, we would supply a higher ammonium fertilizer, it's more acidic, to prevent them from raising pH and running into nutritional problems. The reality is that most of the crops that we grow fall into this intermediate category where they're somewhat tolerant of pH and they're not particularly sensitive, um, they're not particularly likely to change pH over time. Most of the crops fall into that category and so supplying moderate amounts of nitrate and ammonium in the fertilizer um, and having neutral fertilizer programs is, is going to be um, the way to go for most crops. So I'd like to transition now for the remainder um, of the webinar into to correcting low and high pH problems. So um, you've got a problem in your crop and you're seeing deficiency symptoms um, or toxicity, so what do you do about it? Well, the first thing that you should do is, of course, check the substrate pH and electrical conductivity or soluble salts in the root zone um, to see if you have a pH-related problem, and also check root health. So sometimes if you have a damaged or um, diseased root system, you know, the problem can look like a nutritional issue, um, but it's actually related to, to damage or disease. And then if you pick a, a corrective action or you take corrective action, um, to, to correct a higher low pH problem, trial it on a small number of plants first before treating the whole crop. There are several options to correct high pH. One, if fertilizer salts are low in the substrate, simply add more fertilizer because sometimes pH can be high because the substrate is, is leached out of fertilizer nutrients, as we discussed before. You can also switch to a more acidic fertilizer and lower the alkalinity in your water. So if you're switching to an acidic fertilizer, this tends to lower pH usually over a one to two week period. Um, it's good to have ammonium fertilizers on hand for this purpose. And if you have high alkalinity in your water, injecting acid um, is also a good approach. If you have high pH and are experiencing micronutrient deficiencies, um, typically iron deficiency um, crops up first, and so drenching iron at approximately 20 ppm or parts per million of iron is, is um, usually an effective method. Um, there are different forms of iron that you can drench with, iron EDDHA, which is also Sprint 138 or, or similar, works the best at high pH. This is a highly soluble iron form. Just keep in mind that if you're drenching soluble iron and the pH is high, you're only masking the symptoms caused by high pH. And to really correct the issue, you need to lower the pH in the substrate um, one way or the other. And then if you're in an extreme case, acid drenches are another option. And so ferrous iron sulfate drenches at 120 grams per 100 liter rate will rapidly reduce the pH in the root zone and will also supply iron. The risk here is that foliar phytotoxicity um, can be an issue. It's important to rinse the foliage after you apply with clear water and um, avoid this technique on young plants, which are gonna be more sensitive to burn. Some tips with drenching with iron chelates. Common rate would be 33 grams per 100 liters. If you're working with iron EDDHA, this would provide you 20 parts per million of iron. If you're working with iron DTPA, slightly less soluble, but still a good option, um, this would give you 37 parts per million of iron. Apply with heavy leaching to get enough iron into the root zone. Immediately wash the foliage so that you prevent um, burn and, and marking of the leaves. And usually not a good idea to apply to certain crops that are already 
prone to um, iron toxicity issues such as geranium and New Guinea patients. If you have low pH, one option you have is to apply flowable lime. It's effective, it's messy to apply, but it does have long-term residual activity that continues to prevent further drops in pH. You can also drench with potassium bicarbonate or potassium carbonate materials. This has a, a rapid response in increasing pH, but you typically need repeat applications um, over time to make sure pH doesn't go back down. And it can also raise EC because you're also supplying lots of potassium. Switching to a nitrate-based fertilizer is another option. It takes longer to raise the pH with a nitrate-based fertilizer compared to flowable lime or potassium bicarbonate. Um, so it's not suitable for rapid, rapid responses, but it's a good way to help prevent low pH issues from occurring, especially in sensitive crops. And it's most effective when used in a situation where you have alkaline irrigation water. Another option would be to drench with hydrated lime or top dress with hydrated lime. This is a low cost material. It's easy to use, but it can provide some inconsistent results um, as we've seen over the years. A few tips for drenching potassium bicarbonate. You can supply it through your hose or through your emitters or through your ebb and flood system. Applying in cool weather immediately um, is, is a good idea. Um, to prevent burning of the leaves. You also want to immediately rinse the foliage like you would if you're applying any other agrochemical. And then the next day after you apply, it's important to come back through and drench with a very basic high nitrate fertilizer to, to leach out the potassium and reestablish a nutrient balance in the root zone. So after that day, the pH response is, is usually taking place and so it's safe to come in and and um, replenish the nutrients in, in the root zone. So take home messages, managing pH, it doesn't need to be complicated. Um, targeting a pH of 5.5 to 6.4 for most of your crops will be okay. Within this range, most nutrients will be soluble um, in adequate amounts for uptake. And then consider how different factors interact to improve your pH management. So I'd like to thank um, you for your time and joining this webinar. I'd like to thank our sponsors and collaborators as well, SunGrow Horticulture, the Blackmore Company, and also University of Connecticut and University of Massachusetts Extension, um, as well as University of New Hampshire. So thank you very much. And with that, um, I'll pass it over to Jeffrey too, and, and I can field questions also. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Thank you yep. very much for the, uh, the presentation. Um, sorry we have gone over time, but uh, we don't have any questions unless 